Hey, Dr. Wilson here. I'm a molecular and structural biologist, and I'm back to debunk some more COVID-19 misinformation. And this week, I'll be addressing the Great Barrington Declaration. For those of you who don't know, the Great Barrington Declaration is a awful, awful idea. And it is appalling, really, that experts would even suggest something like this as a real plan. It's a plan that essentially says that our solution, our back-to-normal plan for this COVID-19 pandemic is to just let the virus spread enough so that we acquire what's called natural herd immunity against the virus. It will not work this way, and if it did, the consequences would be awful and not what we would call normal. In this video, I'm going to go over the science as to why the Great Barrington Declaration is such a bad idea. And in order to make sure I'm not misquoting the Great Barrington Declaration, I'm going to be showing clips from Talk Radio's interview with one of the co-authors of the Great Barrington Declaration, Sunetra Gupta. Um, well, the, the main thing to uh, address is this issue of immunity declining over time. We've known for a while now that antibodies decline quite rapidly with time, but this it's misleading to say that it implies that protection, immune protection, is lost with time. Well, actually, it's not really misleading. There has been plenty of evidence to show that the presence of anti-spike protein antibodies in a patient's body substantially reduces their risk of being infected with COVID-19. And we know that the antibodies do wane over time. So it is a valid worry that immunity will not last to this coronavirus. It is also nonsensical to say that there is no herd immunity to um or that it's not possible to build up herd immunity to this virus all other coronaviruses um, build up herd immunity uh, by which we mean a level of immunity in the population that ensures that the risks to the vulnerable are low so that's endemic equilibrium herd immunity that's how we're using it okay so the idea here is that she wants to protect the most vulnerable members of our society from SARS-CoV-2 by building up herd immunity in the population. In order to understand why that is not a valid solution, we're going to have to understand what herd immunity is. In order for an infectious disease to actually spread through a population, there has to be a sufficient number of susceptible people in that population. When there are fewer susceptible individuals in a population, the pathogen is going to have a harder time spreading. The most common strategy to reduce the number of susceptible individuals is to make sure that as many people as possible are immune to the pathogen. Normally, this high rate of immunization is achieved through vaccines. Never has any serious expert ever considered the idea of just letting a virus spread throughout a population and expecting that to solve our problems. So, Nobody is saying that naturally acquired herd immunity to COVID-19 is impossible to achieve. We are saying that it is a cruel idea that will not even work to do as Dr. Gupta is saying, protect the most vulnerable individuals. Here is our fate if we allow COVID-19 to spread and take this idea as a real solution. Now, it is not known exactly how much of the population needs to be infected with COVID-19 in order to achieve herd immunity. But let's be nice to this theory, okay? Let's be modest and say that it's 60%. It's more likely in the range of 70 to 80%, but let's just say 60. 60% 60 of the 7 billion people on Earth is 4.2 billion people. That's how many cases of COVID we would need in order to achieve herd immunity. Now, with that many cases, about how many deaths will we have? Well, if we expect the true mortality rate of COVID, which again, we don't know at this point, to be 1%, then that would mean 42 million people dead. If we are going to be modest and say that the mortality rate is 0.5%, that's still 21 million people dead, and even more sickened, even more with long lasting complications. This is what would be required for herd immunity. Not only that, but the way natural herd immunity works and reaching this endemic equilibrium that Dr. Gupta talked about does not eliminate the disease. It does not make the problem go away. Instead, as the number of susceptible people increase, cases will decrease and it will look like the problem has been solved, but it will only be temporary because 
as the number of susceptible people in the population is restored, then we would have another outbreak. This is the fate of the naturally acquired herd immunity plan. It would trap us in a perpetual cycle of outbreak, followed by a period of calm, followed by another outbreak. This cycle would repeat over and over again, adding to the number of deaths that we experience every year and continuing to put vulnerable people in the population at risk. This is not a solution. It's also known that a lot of people don't make antibodies at all upon exposure because there are other arms of the immune system that deal with this virus, such as T-cell immunity. So the picture is more complex. I would say, as a baseline, we could assume that this virus behaves like any other coronavirus, where you do get herd immunity, that is to say, a level of protection in the population that allows us to resume normal lives. Well, the reason that we're able to assume normal life with the common cold coronaviruses is because they're rarely lethal. They are benign. Meanwhile, SARS-CoV-2 has already killed almost 1.8 million people and counting. Also, there's no good evidence that we build up a significant amount of herd immunity to common cold coronaviruses. We already know that antibodies against these common cold coronaviruses are short-lived, and that these viruses circulate every year, and that we commonly get reinfected with them. So, none of this really supports her point. The baseline assumption should be that the duration of immunity to this coronavirus will be the same as to other coronaviruses, which is not lifelong like measles, but it does not impact upon the building up and maintenance of a level of immunity. It does, because when immunity is short-lived, you end up with cycles of outbreak after outbreak after outbreak. Even with measles, one of the most highly infectious respiratory diseases of all time, which does grant lifelong immunity, that went through cycles of outbreaks every two years or so because the number of susceptible individuals gets replenished over time. Again, this is not a solution. So we know that these four corona, other four seasonal coronaviruses co-circulate. We have data on, on that. And we know that from certain studies that one to two percent of the population will typically be carrying one of these coronaviruses. We also know that people are not dying of these coronaviruses um, to the, I mean, of, of the, they are dying, but we don't see that the kind of levels of death that we've just seen with this novel coronavirus. Does she think that they're not dying because of herd immunity? That's not how it works. This virus is different. She understands that, right? SARS-CoV-2 is not a common cold coronavirus. I hope she understands that. So taken together, what we um, expect, we know that by the time that a child is aged five, they've had exposure to all of these coronaviruses. So if you look at the epidemiology of these other coronaviruses, what best fits these data is the idea that each of these coronaviruses gives you immunity for about, you know, five years, should we say. You get reinfected, but you are now immune to severe disease. And this process continues through life. Huh. So it, it seems like she doesn't understand that. Right. Well, SARS-CoV-2 is not a human coronavirus. It is not even close. They are vastly different viruses, so you cannot compare them this way. And again, her solution of reaching this stage of herd immunity, again, requires tens of millions of people just being allowed to die to a virus that we can prevent the spread of. We know how to. We just have to have the will. You stand by everything you'd previously said, Barrington Declaration, that herd immunity, shielding the elderly is the way. This hasn't changed your mind at all. No. That is a real shame to hear. Dr. Gupta, if you want to have a conversation with cameras, have it recorded, or in private, no cameras, I'm all game. Hit me up. Uh, there's also, I mean, there have been statements saying herd immunity never builds up at all, which is... Um, can be easily contradicted, for example, with uh, by the Zika virus um, experience. So Zika virus, there was immunity was very low in Brazil when it came in. It caused an epidemic, saw a spate of microcephalies. Um, then the epidemic settled down to an endemic state, as ep epidemics typically do, through the buildup of natural uh, immunity. Mm. 
It's funny that she mentions this example because most scientists actually think that Zika virus is currently in a calm stage and that we are destined for yet another outbreak, one that will inevitably cause more microcephalies, more stillbirths, and leave us with more grieving mothers. But apparently, Dr. Gupta is okay with that. We can live with it and call that normal life. She would rather do nothing and call it normal life than do anything to prevent all of this from happening in the first place. The Great Barrington Declaration can basically be boiled down into two words. Do nothing. If you honestly support that, seriously reconsider. That's the Great Barrington Declaration debunked. All the sources to all the scientific information I talk about in this video are linked in the description below. Thank you so much for watching. I do hope you enjoyed it. And if you did, make sure to subscribe so you can join me next week where I'll be debunking some more funky stuff. See you then. There's Tesla. Over there is Toby.